welcome to our Google Plus Hangout, celebrating 125 years of integration. Hello, everyone, and welcome to National Geographic's Google Plus Hangout for the Big Cats Initiative on this Google on this Giving Tuesday. I'm Luke Dollar, a National Geographic Explorer, and I help manage the Big Cats Initiative. It's Big Cat Week at National Geographic, and today we're talking about the endangered felines with the people that are raising awareness and doing something to conserve them. We've got a great lineup of participants who are here. Um, joining me today are four partners in Big Cat Conservation that we have, and I'll introduce them one by one and let them say hello very briefly. Uh, first on the lineup is photographer Steve Winter. Steve, where are you and where are you headed right now? I'm in Hoboken, New Jersey. Hi, everyone. And I am heading to India in a couple hours to do some tiger work. Fantastic. Also on the line is National Geographic Channel's Big Cat tracker, Boone Smith. Boone, hi. Where are you and where are you headed next? Hey everybody, I am in southeast Idaho right now, getting geared up to head back to Wyoming for a uh, mountain lion capture. And uh, joining us on the phone from Tanzania are Big Cats Initiative grantee Amy Dickman and Laylee Lichtenfeld. Amy, um, are you on the line with us and where are you calling from? Hi everyone, yes I'm on the line and I'm calling from a tent in the middle of the Tanzanian bush at our field camp in Rwanda. <laughs> So we've got one uh, one caller from a tent in Ruaha in Tanzania, and Laylee Lichtenfeld, I think you're also there in Tanzania in the bush. Can you hear me, and, and where are you? Hi, everyone. Yep, I'm right here, and I can hear you all. I'm calling in from the magnificent Maasai Steps from our environmental center where we have a beautiful view of the stars this evening. Fantastic. And don't forget, everyone that's on the Hangout, we want to hear from you. Post your questions on social media for our Big Cat experts with the hashtag BigCats, B-I-G-C-A-T-S, and we'll try our best to answer them and get to them during this Google Hangout. Um, I thought what we might do to open the call and the, the Hangout was to ask each of the participants how they got involved with their field, uh, specifically why Big Cats. Uh, we've already got one um, question here. Um, Amy, uh, this is from Stephanie Culp via Facebook. Uh, a lot of people are fascinated with your work, Amy. You have uh, some pretty amazing stories. How did you get started as a big cat conservationist, Amy? What do you specifically do, and how did you get started? Uh, it's an interesting question. I was always fascinated by big cats. I'm not quite sure why, because I only had domestic cats, although they were quite large and grumpy. So uh, it was always just a real fascination ever since I was small and uh, all the way through school and I did a zoology degree and after that went and joined the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at Oxford University and that's got a lot of work that it does on big cats. That was a great place to be able to get out into the field. I started in Namibia with the Sheep Conservation Fund before I started my own work here in Tanzania. So yeah, it was just meeting lots of good people who were also interested in big cats. Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. Lele, you're also there in Tanzania. Um, where uh, did, did you start your path to, to being where you are now and doing what you're doing? I always had a love of lions since I was a little girl, and I first got the opportunity to see them in Kenya with the National Outdoor Leadership School, or NOLE, uh, back in 92. And after that, I was fortunate to get a Fulbright scholarship to do research in Kenya, and uh, continue on with my work, master's and PhD at Yale, and just have a love of Africa, the people, and the wildlife, and it's been here ever since. Laylee, about how, how many months a year do you spend there in the field in Tanzania? Tanzania is home, so uh, as many months as I can, usually 10 months a year at least, uh, just take little jumps to the states to raise awareness of what we do. Fantastic. And, and, and Boone, I, I think uh, a little bit closer to home, you're, you're here in America. Tell us a little bit about how you got started as, as a big cat tracker and big cat wrangler. Um, yeah, you know, mine was just kind of the way I was brought up when I was a kid. Every last second was spent in the outdoors. I grew up in a family that uh, um, really took a lot of, of pride in, in being good in some of the things in the outdoors. I had a grandpa and a father that taught me to track and do a lot of things. And so as it came time to make a transition to go to school and choose a career, 
uh, wildlife biology just seemed to be the natural way, and I was fortunate enough to work with some of the, the best scientists and biologists in the world and kind of, you know, really refine some techniques and, and, and be part of some, some really great studies, and it's just kind of exploded from there, and, and, you know, now I get an opportunity to spend, you know, a bunch of days out in the field tracking big cats in a variety of habitats, and, you know, it's kind of turned into a, a dream job. Awesome. Uh, I, I believe we've actually got a photograph of Steve Winter's newest book uh, that we'll try to put up online, that we'll try to roll in for you guys to see. Uh, Steve, you're, you're out in the field quite a bit behind a camera. Uh, your recently published book, Tigers Forever, Saving the World's Most Endangered Big Cat, um, plus a lot of um, magazine work and a recent article about cougars features your work. What drew you to big cats and specifically photography as a medium for promoting big cats and communicating issues around them? Well, I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer since I was eight years old growing up in Indiana. Um, I think uh, cats chose me. I didn't choose big cats. Uh, my first story I did for the magazine, uh, uh, a jaguar came to my door one night um, and scratched under the door and sniffed and scared me to death. And then I saw him about three weeks later, and then I decided I was going to leave and and uh, because I kind of didn't know how to react. So I came back and... Um, called Alan Rabinowitz up, who uh, is now CEO of Panthera, and asked him whether he thought we could, it would be possible to do a Jaguar story. So I did the first Jaguar story for National Geographic magazine. And that began my career working, uh, you know, mainly with him. He got me started on Tigers, too. And uh, my, my 10 years with Tigers that resulted in the book, Tigers Forever, that was just published two weeks ago. Thanks, Steve. You photographed cougars, snow leopards, tigers, and jaguars. Um, if you had to pick one big cat to photograph again, what would it be? Well, uh, I love all of them. I mean, you know, not not having a background in biology or anything, uh, you know, they're all so unique in their own way. Snow leopards were so difficult because of the physicalness and the uh, cold, sleeping out at 30 to 50 degrees below zero. You can see tigers, and they're the most endangered, so I would say that, you know, like I'm going back to do tiger work right now with my wife who wrote the book. We're doing some videos for uh, National Geographic Magazine website, and uh, I want to keep doing that. Uh, that's what we need to do to raise awareness and give people reason to care. The most popular animal or a cat in the world is also the most endangered big cat. Now, there's something uh, wrong about that balance, <laughs> and we need to figure it out. Absolutely. Steve, we've got a question for you that came from Anne-Marie Korup in Denmark on Google+. And her question for you is, in order to get the picture, where is your limit in terms of the distance to big cats, You know, not only for the cat's safety but your own safety? What's your limit, Steve? Well, I think uh, respect is number one, that we don't do anything that will harm the animal in any way, shape, or form. Um, I use remote cameras because of that. Uh, I like getting a very intimate view that the animal ends up taking itself with a camera trap. So I do that as far as danger goes. Uh, I work with local people, the guards that protect these animals. I need to trust them, and to trust them, I need to respect them uh, 100%. And uh, what they tell me to do, I do, and uh, because they're the experts, not me. So um, you don't get close. You just follow their lead and uh, go from there. And Steve, you've actually been out in the field with Boone, so I'd like to kind of throw this question to him. You know, Boone uh, has hosted uh, film crews and photographers and, and uh, uh, also works very closely with researchers, collaring cats, tracking cats, taking measurements, etc. cetera. Um, Boone, what's, what's, your, what's your limit in terms of uh, your own safety and the safety of the cats when you're in the field with them? Yeah, our, our scenario is just a, a little bit different um, because obviously when we're going out and, and you have an animal like a cougar or a snow leopard, um, extremely secretive, elusive, it's really hard to be able to go out and just observe it. Um, so thus we, we need those radio collars on to be able to get the information. And that means we need to physically have the cat in our hands at some point in time. 
and, and I feel fortunate in the sense that I've been able to work with a bunch of groups like uh, Pantera, Wildlife Conservation Society, Craighead Lindy South, some other groups, where we've really been able to fine tune and hone some of these capture techniques. And, and you know, the two general rules are uh, the safety of the animal is first and foremost, and then our safety is second. And so in doing that, uh, you know, I rely on a lot of different experience from just being out there in the woods from growing up to working with different researchers. You know, I, I mean, you know, I got the chance to work with Steve, um, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and was able to learn things from him. And, and so every time you go get to work with a different person, a different group, you pay attention and you, you put those things into your toolbox and your arsenal. And, and then, although it sounds kind of crazy, uh, there's a lot of common sense that goes into it when you approach a cat. Um, these cats are no different than people in the sense that they're going to tell you where that line is. And everyone's line for people is yeah. different. And, and so those cats, they're the same thing. Some have a little more tolerance, some don't. Um, I, I know you know, F-51 is the cat, I, the cougar I think of that Steve photographed that was in yeah. the magazine. She was tolerant. She, she was willing to tolerate us coming in and, and doing some things. And some others, like F-109, was like, yeah, I see you guys. And, and so, you know, reading the body language, these, these cats tell you what's going on, and you respect that. I, I know Steve mentioned that. It's you got to have that respect. And if you give them that respect, uh, you know, that, that's how we keep the cats and, and ourselves and everybody out there safe. Sounds good. Um, Laylee, you're there in Tanzania 10 months a year. Um, you are in big cat country out there. Um, uh, I don't think you're behind a fence all the time, and I don't think you're inside all the time either. So uh, you and your husband, Charles Trout, and uh, and your young, young newest addition, um, what what are the limits, what are the lines for you in, in doing lion conservation, for example, in Tanzania there? Well, we've got to be really careful with our work. Um, we do a lot of different ways of estimating the populations of lions. Some of the easiest work is putting out camera traps leave the cameras out and then take pictures of the cats when they move by. Um, but we also like to track our cats, you know where they are and where they're moving. So we work with Agape Bushman trackers and these are the guys that really have the sense for the big cats. Um, they can read the landscape, they can understand where the cats have moved um, and sometimes we go in on foot with them and we have to be really careful. Um, you can surprise a lioness uh, in a corongo which is a, a gully or a ravine. Um, and you can get into some um, scary situations. So, like Boone said, you've really got to let the big cats tell you their limits. Um, you don't want to get too close with them, and I certainly don't want to get too close with them with my little girl, Kima. She's uh, going to turn one year old in, in about six days. So, um, <laughs> we just listen to the cats, but we have to get the information so that we know that our work is being effective and that uh, we're helping to increase the population of these uh, endangered, beautiful animals. And, and that work that's being done in the field is in part um, supported by National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative. Um, this being Giving Tuesday, um, I'd like to give you guys a little background on what the Big Cats Initiative is. Uh, the Big Cats Initiative is National Geographic's program that supports projects and field work, education, outreach, uh, incentive efforts, global public awareness campaigns to save big cats and stop the declines of their populations worldwide. Uh, a few years ago, longtime explorers and residents with National Geographic, Derek and Beverly Joubert, pushed National Geographic to go one step beyond the mission of the organization, which is inspiring people to care about the planet, and to actually do something more than just reporting and, and, and delivering the messages, which is very important. And the Big Cats Initiative was formed. The Big Cats Initiative is based on sound science informing good decisions to fund field-based conservation actions. Uh, Amy and Laylee, who you're hearing from today, are, are both grantees, multiple-time grantees of the Big Cats Initiative, in order to halt the decline as quickly as possible of big cats in the places where they are. In the, the three years since the Big Cats Initiative launched, the BCI, which is Big Cats Initiative, has funded 43 projects in 18 countries to the tune of nearly $1.3 million, and all of them are field-based projects programs. And one of the things we set out to do was identify what are some of the best, fastest things that can be done in order to protect big cats where they are. We have to know their status, so assessment is important. But, you know, we already know that there are 
fewer than 3,200 tigers left in the wild, six to 8,000 snow leopards left in the wild, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 lions, but regardless, it's a 90% decline in, in under a century. Uh, no more than 10,000 cheetahs left. Those numbers are staggering enough, and that's what led the Joubert's and National Geographic to launch the Big Cats Initiative to fund grassroots level campaigns and actions to do that. Uh, a lot of great questions are now coming in. Uh, they've been tweeted, they've been posted, uh, commented on social media. Remember, it's not too late to ask a question. Please post, tweet, or comment from wherever you're watching with hashtag BigCats. There's a new question that comes from Celeste Leander on Facebook uh, that was, which species of big cat is most critically endangered? Steve, I, I think you spoke to that just now. Um, right. And uh, would you want to give us some feedback on what the answer to that question is? Well, the most endangered big cat is the uh, tiger. Um, there's only 32, maybe only 3,000 left in the wild. And it's an incredibly dramatic decline in um, tiger populations. And it's at a critical point right now. Um, and that was one of the reasons that, that we had the idea to put all my work together 10 years into the book Tigers Forever, which is named after Panthera's Tiger Program, where I'm director of media, besides my 20 years working as a photographer at National Geographic Magazine. And it's on the ground protection. That's number one. And I learned from uh, the scientists I work with that the way you're going to save them is to protect their prey first, protect the protected areas where the source populations are at. And if those areas are protected, tigers will take care of themselves. But protection and good science is the background towards saving tigers. And they need, you know, more land and, uh, in, the, in the areas that they're in and corridors to move from one area to another. And so my goal right now is to... Uh, the promotion of the book is actually promotion of the saving of tigers. Because you know? the book is not just a bunch of pictures. It's... It's 45,000 words and, and 68 interviews and 12 uh, profiles of uh, the people that I worked with. And we need to save the tiger. We can do it. Thank you, Steve. Um, Amy, you are a specialist in the reasons that people kill big cats like lions. Amy Dickman there in Tanzania. Uh, can you tell me... Uh, what kinds of things have you learned about the reasons why people kill lions and, and what sort of things are you doing there <coughs> with the Ruaha Carnivore Project to prevent the further loss of big cats in the places where you are? Well, I think one of the important things that people have got to accept is that an awful lot of these big cats are still living outside protected areas, on areas where sort of human dominated land where you've often got very poor human and you know, these cats are huge problems for local people by taking the livestock, and there's really better benefits in return in most of those places. So it's very simple, I think, people have got to demonize the local community for killing species like lions. But any one of us wouldn't want to live on an animal that's killing your livestock, you know, destroying your sort of wealth, and you know, essentially killing your children as well. So the first and foremost thing we have to do is work with them to reduce and try to safeguard their livestock, because that's an important source of wealth for them. And we've been very effective at doing that through the CPI-sponsored BOMA campaign. When you build a BOMA campaign, is, you know, as I'm sure you'll mention, building on that. But almost as importantly, or more importantly, we've really got to give local people a benefit from big cat presence. So we've talked to villagers, they want to invest in schools, then we've worked with National Geographic on the Sister Schools program, uh, they want to invest in healthcare, in veterinary health, just making sure that people see a direct benefit from conserving these cats, because it's up to these local communities. I totally agree with Steve, we have to protect the source core population, but if we all, if we ignore those human-dominated lands, I think that's going to be a death knell for a lot of the remaining lion populations, certainly. I agree Thank 100%. You, Amy. That's great. Thank you, Amy. Laylee, uh, you're there in Tanzania, a little bit north of where Amy is right now. Um, you know, Amy, Amy pointed out to us that uh, conflict is a big cause of mortality in uh, wildlife populations uh, and pointed out some of the things that can be done to mitigate that. Can you speak specifically about what the African People and Wildlife Fund is doing there in uh, the Terengiri region? 
Great. Well, African People and Wildlife Fund, we're leading a four-step process for big cat conservation. It starts with putting out fire conflict uh, with our Living Walls Project, which is a way of reinforcing people's livestock corrals, um, and it's supported very heavily by the National Geographic Build a Zona Project. We've got 300 of these living walls in place heading towards 350 thanks to supporters that are helping National Geographic and ACW build Zona. Um, once we put out those fires of conflict, well then we have to really help people look at natural resource management. How do we manage the landscape for people and big cats? We have a large educational program that helps build the skills, the tools, and the knowledge that people need to manage their resources. And then we actually help them implement them. So we're working on rangeland protection, watershed protection. And finally, like Amy said, finding ways for to build conservation incentives. How can we build an economically friendly community on the Maasai Step? And we're supporting women's microloan initiatives for environmentally friendly projects. And we're also supporting large land conservation projects to help communities to conserve their land and to benefit from it. Thank you, Laylee. Um, that's a perfect segue into introducing the Build a Boma campaign. Um, the Big Cats Initiative cause marketing push for uh, right now is called Build a Boma. If you go to buildaboma.org, you'll learn more about how loss of livestock is a major factor in people wanting to retaliate and kill big cats, specifically lions, but all sorts of wildlife, um, as, you know, really all over the world. But we're focusing right now in Kenya and Tanzania with four of the Big Cats Initiative grantees who are fortifying the corrals that keep these livestock safe so that it avoids the conflict in the first place. If you go to buildaboma.org, you'll learn a lot more about how helping people protect their livestock and their livelihoods actually translates into more cats in the field. Education is something that um, that both Amy and Laylee pointed on as well. And Boone, I think you've actually visited a Big Cats Initiative sister school where uh, we have schools in uh, the U.S. that are twinned with schools in uh, Big Cat range countries. And you've visited uh, at least one of those that I'm aware of. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that experience and how education, even in America, is important for helping to protect Big Cats worldwide? Yeah, that was actually a, a really, really neat experience to go be part of that with the sister school. They had a chance to go to a couple of them. And it, it's, a, it's a great program because it, it's kind of run by the kids. Like the, there's some guidelines set up. The kids have to participate in fundraisers. But they have these interactions with the sister schools over in Africa and different places and get a glimpse into the lifestyle that folks live over there and, and their wildlife and their, their landscape and, and their natural resources. And so as far as an educational component, one of the schools I went to is in the, was in the Bronx. Uh, so you've got these <laughs> kids in, 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 in the I mean, inner city, which, you know, the African savanna is the most boring thing to them. And it was so cool to walk in, in that school and see the posters they've made, the, the, the different interactions they had back and forth with the kids over there in Africa, the little videos they sent back and forth. And, and I mean, these kids were so ridiculously excited about big cats. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I, I've never felt like a rock star when I walked in somewhere. And these kids <laughs> wanted to talk big cats. They wanted, what could they do? How do we get there? I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And, and they've done fundraisers. They've done awareness um, programs and campaigns. And so it's, it's an absolutely a great a great thing to be involved with. You know, because a lot of times I think folks, we, we hear, you know, I, I see Steve's book and I hear it and it's like, yeah, you know, we do need to save the tigers. And people go, Good, go save that, Steve, and, and get on that. And, and we don't realize that, that <laughs> folks, even just sitting at home, even if you're not the, the researcher out there in the field, there's ways to be involved. Uh, you know, the, the Big Cats Initiative, the, the Cause and Uphold Program, there's ways to be involved and support and help. And, and, and like I said, the coolest thing I think that I've seen about the, the Big Cats Initiative is when, when people do become involved financially and monetarily and they, they put some money in there, it does. It goes right into the field of these guys. It goes to the things they need to do, and, and I think that is so great because field work is tough. <laughs> I mean, it just is. It, it beats people up. It beats up equipment. And to know that you can get some equipment and, and have better things out there to do your work to be more effective. I mean, I, I think great programs all the way around. 
<laughs> Thanks, Boone. Laylee, um, speaking from the field side of, of how you know kids in America are learning about and supporting big cats, can you speak very briefly about how uh, the, a school near you has benefited from Big Cats Initiative Sister School program as a way that kids can get involved? Well, through the sister school program, we've been so lucky that our sister school in Philadelphia um, helped to donate a laptop computer, solar panels, and an invert so that our school uh, here in Tanzania in the Maasai Steppe could get connected and could learn more about the big cats online. Um, we're working towards a, a system where the kids can actually talk to one another across, uh, across the ocean. So uh, we were so lucky to have that support from the Big, big Cat Sister School program. Fantastic. Uh, I would like to switch gears and go to some of our um, um, questions that are coming in via social media right now. Um, Steve, I have a question from Epi Belena from Bombang Nueva Vizcaya via Facebook. Um, Steve, um, uh, Epi says, thank you for sharing your photos. The picture of the tigers, especially the mother and cub, makes me teary. It looks as if she's asking to be kept safe from poachers. How do you capture such emotion? I wonder if big cats really feel that way. Steve, what well, do you think? I think uh, this is the picture right there, if you can see it. Perfect. And uh, on the cover of the book, all mothers are the same. She has young babies, and she wants to protect them. And it was my job to get that image, and it took me 28 days to... Uh, to finally get the one second where that happened, five frames, five seconds. And you want to talk about Terry? I wouldn't look at the back of the camera for about three hours because I didn't get it until <laughs> like the 24th day. And when I looked at the back of the camera, it was perfect. One frame, and I cried like a baby and uh, couldn't stop. It's only happened to me twice in my life. I've looked at the back of the camera. One was snow leopards and one was tigers. So all moms feel the same, protecting their young so they will have a future in this instance, so the tigers will have a future. Fantastic. Steve, I've got a follow-up question from Chance Barber via Facebook from Illinois. What were your best and worst experiences photographing all of these amazing animals, Steve? Well, golly, best experiences, they happen all the time. You know, uh, you could say, well, it's when I got a photograph I'm trying to get, like the one on the cover. But, uh, you know, just being out in nature is, is just so rewarding. Working with wonderful local people that, you know, they have to find a way to benefit from the fact that they're living with predators we want on the face of the earth. So great things happen all the time with every species I work with. The worst thing that's ever happened is always when you almost die. <laughs> I mean, um, the worst, the the worst animal attacks that ever happened to me are all microscopic animals. But there was that rhino that attacked us when I was on an elephant once in India that scared me to death. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so the best happen constantly, and luckily the worst don't happen that often, but except for the parasites. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Boone, let's move over to you. I've got a couple of questions. Uh, Noah Hirsch on Google Plus um, says he's been tracking mountain lions for three years now, and he's trying to understand their movement in urban city areas and asks, how do you know when it becomes too dangerous to keep tracking them in terms of uh, your own safety? We've touched on this a bit, but uh, it's a perfect segue into the question I'd like you to respond to as well, which is from uh, Anne-Marie Korup in Denmark via Google, Google Plus that says, what is your view on this idea that humans can bring up cats, raise them themselves, either out in the bush or in captivity, and essentially befriend these big cats? What is, what's your view on that? Um, you know, we see cougars moving into urban areas, and we also see people wanting to keep big cats as pets, both in the bush and the wild. Um, how do you see the line being drawn on that? <laughs> I look at that, and that's definitely a hot topic right now. You know, I look at it, first and foremost, what incredible adaptability of an animal. You know, we come in and change the environment, the habitat, and it adapts and it becomes efficient there, and it can thrive. 
um, you know, always you need to give animals their space and, and be safe about what you're doing out there. Uh, you know, when the, the question as far as dealing with tracking a cougar, cougars are pretty secretive. If you've been out, they've probably seen you. Um, you. You probably haven't seen them, and so when you do get those opportunities to see a cat, you know, everyone always asks, what do I do when I see a cougar? Take a moment and enjoy it because you're getting a rare and unique opportunity. Um, you know, as far as our interaction when we, when we have cats and bring them into captivity, we, we have to recognize that these animals, they're hardwired over, you know, thousands and thousands of years for certain instincts to survive in the wild, and, and we don't just change that because we give them a bowl of milk or, or we, we pet them or things like that. And, um, you know, certainly there's some instances here and there where, where we have captured cats, and, and we look at them and go, well, well is, is that good or bad? And, you know, there, there's, I, I work with a couple groups that have, you know, some rescue facilities for really for that purpose right there. If someone's had a cat, they raised it as a kitten, they thought it was cute, it got too big to handle, and, and so they had to do something with it, so they took it into the facility. And there's some opportunities there for ambassador animals, I think, um, you know, for people to see things up close, uh, to be excited about what these animals are and what they can do and some education opportunities. Uh, but certainly, the more we can keep in the wild, being wild animals, doing their thing, uh, that's just the better. Um, if we have those unfortunate circumstances where things change, if, if we can get the greater good out of it, I think that's important too. Uh, but certainly it's not something we want to promote that, uh, you know, people go and get baby tigers and try and raise them because they're so beautiful and they're endangered, so you raise your own. Uh, you know, it's going to end in, in probably a disaster. So, uh, again, it comes really back to common sense. Uh, don't let your emotions get caught up in things. And, and, you know, use some common sense about it, and we'll be okay. Thanks, Boone. Uh, another question we got here from... Um, Rick in the U.S. via uh, NG, uh, via National Geographic, is, is what can the average person do to help? And uh, to that end, uh, I think we've heard a lot of wonderful um, input today from, from all of our, our participants in here. Boone in the States, Steve there in New York on his way to India, both Amy and Amy Dickman and Laylee Lichtenfeld there in the field in Tanzania, uh, about the things that can be done, not only raising awareness and, and educating each other, but also supporting the idea of big cat conservation uh, in any way possible, uh, spreading the word. Um, on this Giving Tuesday, you can support Build a Boma by going to buildaboma.org, B-U-I-L-D-A-B-O-M-A.org, and learn more about how we can protect big cats through that very cost-effective way. Or you can go to causeanuproar.org, which is the Big Cats Initiative's um, home on the web, causeanuproar.org, and learn more about the Big Cats Initiative and all that's being done in the field by all of our wonderful partners and grantees. Uh, thank you so much for being here on this Giving Tuesday. Thank you for joining us today. We will hope you'll support the work of all of these great people we've heard from, and um, do what you can as well to save the world's remaining big cats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much from Tanzania.